and this is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program. Dan Friedel reports on farmers in Kansas who have stopped growing wheat after a bad growing season. Faith Perlo answers a question about non-count and mass nouns. Later, we listen to a tall tale about Pecos Bill. But first, the Midwestern U.S. state of Kansas is one of the country's top grain-producing states. But farmers there are having to kill or plow over their winter wheat crop after a bad growing season. Farmers plant winter wheat in the autumn, and it grows during the winter and early spring. Harvest time is in the summer. By the month of May, farmers have a good idea about the health of the wheat plants. This year's crop has suffered from the extremely dry and cold winter that Kansas experienced. The weather hurt the grain and kept it from growing well. As a result, farmers are choosing to kill, plow over, or give up on their wheat fields. That information comes from a recent survey. Of industry experts and visits to Kansas farms by Reuters reporters. Some farmers will make an insurance claim to get a little bit of money. Others are letting cows walk their fields and eat the plants. Much of the wheat produced in Kansas is used for making bread. This year, many bread makers will have to look for other wheat sources. In nearby states, farmers who planted wheat in late 2022 are also reporting problems. Farmers across the U.S. plan to abandon 33 percent of their winter crop. That is the highest percentage in over 100 years. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, about 19 percent of the winter wheat fields in Kansas will not be harvested this spring. That is up from 10 percent last year and 2 percent in 2021. Farm experts who recently visited Kansas say the percentage could grow even higher. Justin Gilpin is chief executive of the Kansas Wheat Commission. He said the percentage of abandoned fields could come close to 1989. That year, farmers gave up on 28 percent of their wheat. You have a wheat crop that didn't come up, Gilpin said. Gilpin noted. That there is a great demand for hay. Hay comes from the stems and leaves of plants such as wheat. The wheat is cut, dried, and sent to farms for animals to eat. Some farmers are cutting the plants early, making hay, and then selling it to animal farms. In Kansas. Farmers are expected to produce only 191.4 million bushels of winter wheat this year. That would be the smallest wheat harvest since 1963. But the Wheat Quality Council, an industry group, believes the amount will be even lower. Those in the wheat business are not sure of the numbers yet because. They do not yet know how many fields will be abandoned. 
people who work for insurance companies are going around Kansas looking at fields and deciding how much they will pay the farmers for their lost crops. Other farmers with dead wheat are thinking of planting sorghum, which could still grow this year even in dry conditions. The wheat growing problem is not only in Kansas. In the neighboring state of Oklahoma, Farmers are also worried about their harvest. In the northern part of the state, close to Kansas, some farmers will only harvest about 35% of the wheat they planted last year. Clay Shem owns land in western Kansas. He said planting wheat in the autumn and then seeing it fail to grow is kind of like watching a loved one go through a terminal illness. The bad wheat season also hurts the businesses in the area, such as hotels and restaurants. When farmers decide not to harvest their wheat, fewer laborers come to the area to help. As a result, Not as many people eat at restaurants or stay in hotels. Kansas State University's College of Agriculture also suffers. It normally gets about $1 million from the Kansas Wheat Commission for programs and research. However, that money comes from wheat sales. If less wheat is sold, less money comes in. We may not be able to do as much, said the College of Agriculture's leader, Ernie Minton. It slows down the whole life cycle of wheat research. I'm Dan Friedel. Hi, Faith. What's today's topic for Ask a Teacher? Hi, Dan. Today, we are answering Lily's question about nouns that cannot be counted, which means that they do not have a plural form. We call them non-count or mass nouns. Hmm, that sounds interesting. So we don't add the plural endings S or ES? That's right, Dan. And these nouns do not have any regular plural ending either like child to children. Are there different kinds of non-count nouns? Yes, there are many categories of them. Food is a category like cheese, rice, and sugar. Study subjects like history, biology, and math. Games like football, tennis, and soccer. And also gerunds, you know, the nouns formed from verbs with the ing ending, like Writing, dancing, and reading. Oh, yeah. We've talked about gerunds before. Also, things like fire, air, and ice. Can those be non-count nouns as well? Yes, those are natural substances. And even things like money, work, and happiness are all non-count or mass nouns. It sounds like these nouns are very common, Faith. Thanks for introducing them to us. Now let's listen to this week's Ask a Teacher. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about non-count and mass nouns. Dear Learning English, thank you so much for your excellent programs. How do we know how to use the singular and plural of some nouns, like effort versus efforts? Both show in people's writing. For some nouns, it is very hard to know if they should be used in the singular or plural, like experience or faculty. Thank you, Lily. Dear Lily, thank you for your question. 
These words are in a group called mass or non-count nouns. These nouns are not counted as individual things. They present problems even for native speakers of English sometimes. While there are many non-count and mass nouns, we will provide some general rules to help you use them. Non-count and mass nouns do not have a plural form. For example, sand or milk would be difficult to count. Particles of sand are too small and numerous, and milk is a liquid. Mass nouns or non-count nouns can describe abstract concepts like advice. In some cases, faculty is a collective noun, not a mass noun. Collective nouns describe many individuals who form a group. For example, the faculty is made up of individual teachers. However, if you hear the word faculties, it often is describing a person's powers of the body or mind. The teacher aimed to develop the student's faculties of critical thought. Non-count nouns are always singular. There are no plural forms of non-count nouns. Sometimes nouns can be both mass and count nouns. Many people use effort and experience as mass nouns while describing a concept, but they can become plural when talking about repeating or multiple attempts, efforts, or individual experiences. Her boss noticed her efforts on the project over the past few weeks, repeating or multiple attempts. The vacation package offers many different experiences, like snorkeling, swimming in the ocean, or hiking in the rainforest. Another example of a noun that can be a mass or count noun is paper. The teacher collected the students' final papers. Count noun referring to the students' individual pieces of writing. I need to buy some paper for the printer. Mass noun. Since non-count nouns cannot be counted, numbers are not used with them. We need to add other words if we want to talk about an amount of a non-count noun. We use words like types, slices, or pieces. Kelly always has four types of cheese in her refrigerator. The teacher handed the student three pieces of paper to take his test on. I eat two slices of bread in the morning. Lastly, we do not use the indefinite articles a or an with non-count or mass nouns. We do use the definite article the. The rising water flooded the town. Please let us know if these explanations and examples helped you, Lily. What questions do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Today we tell a traditional American story called A Tall Tale. A Tall Tale is a story about a person who is larger than life. 
The descriptions in the story are exaggerated, much greater than in real life. Long ago, the people who settled in undeveloped areas in America first told tall tales. After a hard day's work, people gathered to tell each other funny stories. Pecos Bill was a larger-than-life hero of the American West. No one knows who first told stories about Pecos Bill. Cowboys may have invented the stories. Others say Edward O'Reilly invented the character in stories he wrote for the Century magazine in the early 1900s. The stories were collected in a book called The Saga of Pecos Bill, published in 1923. Another writer, James Cloyd Bowman, wrote an award-winning children's book called Pecos Bill, The Greatest Cowboy of All Time. The book won the Newbery Honor in 1938. Pecos Bill was not a historical person, but he does represent the spirit of early settlers in the American West. His unusual childhood and extraordinary actions tell about people who believed there were no limits to what they could do. Now, here is Barbara Klein with our story. Pecos Bill had one of the strangest childhoods a boy ever had. It all started after his father decided that there was no longer enough room in East Texas for his family. Pack up, Ma, he cried. Neighbors moving in 50 miles away. It's getting too crowded. So they loaded up a wagon with all their things. Now some say they had 15 children while others say 18. However many there were, the children were louder than thunder. And as they set off across the wild country of West Texas, their mother and father could hardly hear a thing. Now, as they came to the Pecos River, the wagon hit a big rock, the force threw little Bill out of the wagon, and he landed on the sandy ground. Mother did not know Bill was gone until she gathered the children for the midday meal. Mother set off with some of the children to look for Bill, but they could find no sign of him. Well, some people say Bill was just a baby when his family lost him. Others say he was four years old. But all agree that a group of animals called coyotes found Bill and raised him. Bill did all the things those animals did, like chase lizards and howl at the moon. He became as good a coyote as any. Now, Bill spent 17 years living like a coyote until one day a cowboy rode by on his horse. Some say the cowboy was one of Bill's brothers. Whoever he was, he took one look at Bill and asked, What are you? Bill was not used to human language. At first, he could not say anything. The cowboy repeated his question. This time, Bill said, Varmint. That is a word used for any kind of wild animal. No, you aren't, said the cowboy. Yes, I am, said Bill. I have fleas. Lots of people have fleas, said the cowboy. You don't have a tail. Yes, I do, said Bill. Show it to me then, 
the cowboy said. Bill looked at his backside and realized that he did not have a tail like the other coyotes. Well, what am I then? asked Bill. You're a cowboy, so start acting like one, the cowboy cried out. Well, that was all Bill needed to hear. He said goodbye to his coyote friends and left to join the world of humans. Now, Pecos Bill was a good cowboy. Still, he hungered for adventure. One day, he heard about a rough group of men. There is some debate over what the group was called, but one storyteller calls it the Hell's Gate Gang. So Bill set out across the rough country to find this gang of men. Well, Bill's horse soon was injured, so Bill had to carry it for a hundred miles. Then Bill met a rattlesnake fifty feet long. The snake made a hissing noise and was not about to let Bill pass. But after a tense minute, Bill beat the snake until it surrendered. He felt sorry for the varmint, though, and wrapped it around his arm. After Bill walked another hundred miles, he came across an angry mountain lion. There was a huge battle, but Bill took control of the big cat and put his saddle on it. He rode that mountain lion all the way to the camp of the Hell's Gate gang. Now, when Bill saw the gang, he shouted out, Who's the boss around here? A huge cowboy, nine feet tall, took one look at Bill and said in a shaky voice, I was the boss, but you are the boss from here on in. With his gang, Pecos Spill was able to create the biggest ranch in the Southwest. Bill and his men had so many cattle that they needed all of New Mexico to hold them. Arizona was the pasture where the cattle ate grass. Pecos Bill invented the art of being a cowboy. He invented the skill of throwing a special rope called a lasso over a cow's head to catch wandering cattle. Some say he used a rattlesnake for a lasso. Others say he made a lasso so big that it circled the whole earth. Bill invented the method of using a hot branding iron to permanently put the mark of a ranch on a cow's skin. That helped stop people from stealing cattle. Some say he invented cowboy songs to help calm the cattle and make the cowboy's life easier. But he is also said to have invented tarantulas and scorpions, as jokes. Cowboys have had trouble with those poisonous creatures ever since. Now, Pecos Bill could ride anything that ever was. So, as some tell the story, there came a storm bigger than any other. It all happened during the worst drought the West had ever seen. It was so dry that horses and cows started to dry up and blow away in the wind. So when Bill saw the windstorm, he got an idea. The huge tornado kicked across the land like a wild bronco. But Bill jumped on it without a thought. 
He rode that tornado across Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, all the time squeezing the rain out of it to save the land from drought. When the storm was over, Bill fell off the tornado. He landed in California. He left a hole so deep that to this day it is known as Death Valley. Now, Bill had a horse named Widowmaker. He got that name because any man who rode that horse would be thrown off and killed, and his wife would become a widow. No one could ride that horse but Bill. And Widowmaker, in the end, caused the biggest problem for Pecos Bill. You see, one day, Bill saw a woman. Not just any woman, but a wild, red-haired woman riding a giant catfish down the Rio Grande River. Her name was Slewfoot Sue, and Bill fell in love with her at first sight. Well, Bill would not rest until he had asked for her hand in marriage, and Slewfoot Sue accepted. On their wedding day, Pecos Bill dressed in his best buckskin suit, and Sue wore a beautiful white dress with a huge steel spring bustle in the back. It was the kind of big dress that many women wore in those days. The bigger, the better. Now, after the marriage ceremony, Slewfoot Sue got a really bad idea. She decided that she wanted to ride Widowmaker. Bill begged her not to try, but she had her mind made up. Well, the second she jumped on the horse's back, he began to kick and buck like nothing anyone had ever seen. He sent Sue flying so high that she sailed clear over the new moon. She fell back to earth, but the steel spring bustle just bounced her back up as high as before. Now, there are many different stories about what happened next. One story says Bill saw that Sue was in trouble, she would keep bouncing forever if nothing was done. So he took his rope out, though some say it was a huge rattlesnake, and lassoed Sue to catch her and bring her down to earth. Only she just bounced him back up with her. Somehow the two came to rest on the moon, and that's where they stayed. Some people say they raised a family up there. Their children were as loud and wild as Bill and Sue were in their younger days. People say the sound of thunder that sometimes carries over the dry land around the Pecos River is nothing more than Pecos Bill's family laughing up a storm. Once there was a drought that spread all over Texas, so to sunny California he did go. And though the gag is kind of corny, he brought rain to California. That's the way we got the Gulf of Mexico. So you be I A, I A, you be I O, for the toughest critter west of the Alamo. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 